All right, Krishna. Uh, today, which is uh, September 14th, 2018, uh, I'm going to begin a, um, a program, which hopefully will be daily, uh, in which I will comment on the news. I will pick a news item and uh, try to give a Krishna conscious and rational perspective on the news. And um, today, uh, hopefully without malice or any inappropriate sectarian feelings, I would like to speak about the uh, gigantic and growing scandal and uh, crisis which is facing the Catholic Church. Uh, of course, I'm speaking about the child abuse scandal. We know years ago, several years ago, uh, there were scandals all around the world regarding priestly child abuse, and then the church had to pay billions of dollars uh, to settle legal cases. And then just recently, it, it has all erupted again, and uh, it's almost worse this time for various reasons. Uh, the state attorney general in Pennsylvania, one of the uh, larger American states, conducted an investigation in which they found hundreds of priests were involved in child abuse over, over a period of 70 years. In Germany, they just issued a report uh, showing that over a thousand priests were involved in child abuse, just in Germany. And of course, in Australia, there have been cases. And, and, and basically, you know, if you just, wherever you pick up a rock underneath it, you find priestly child abuse. So what's going on? Uh, in any religion, including the Hare Krishna movement and every other religion I've ever heard of, there are problems. And you have some cases of this evil of uh, child sex abuse. But I don't know of any religion in the world that has this problem on the gigantic, inconceivable scale of the Roman Catholic Church, where we're talking about thousands of priests and, and God knows how many abused children, perhaps in the tens of thousands. So this is, a, of course, for one thing, the Catholic Church is the largest religious institution on earth. And so you could say, well, they operate on a different scale. But even taking into account the, the size of that largest religious institution, we're still talking about a, just an unreal amount, number of uh, cases where priests, we're not talking about people who are Catholics and commit child abuse, we're talking about priests. And so um, I'd like to make a few points here. Uh, I think one of the problems, clearly, which the church is now starting to admit, well, some people in the church, actually, a lot of people fight against it, uh, this problem with the, this artificial and, frankly, pretty stupid rule uh, that only a not celibate, only an unmarried man, I can't say celibate, but only an unmarried man can be a priest. Now, I don't mean to offend anyone. I think this rule is actually stupid. I don't mean to say the church is stupid, but this rule is certainly stupid. And for various reasons, number one, Jesus obviously didn't teach this. The rule came maybe a thousand years after Jesus, roughly. Uh, the reason will be understandable to members of the Hare Krishna movement. Just like in India, let's say in Vrindavan, the most prominent historical temples, not ISKCON temples, but the older historical temples, all belong, really belong, to families, to priestly families. And they pass these temples down. Of course, they do the service, the seva, they do the worship, and so that when people come, they can see the deities and so on. But really, the church, 
for all practical purposes, belongs to these extended priestly families. And something like that was happening in the Catholic Church, Roman Catholic Church, a very long time ago. So they made a simple rule. To be a priest, you have to be celibate. Therefore, no families can gain control, power, ownership over or of uh, churches. So that rule of only celibate, not celibates, only unmarried men can be priests uh, in Catholic history comes long, long, long after Jesus. And it was essentially for property concerns. Now, interestingly, the Roman Catholic Church justifies this rule in the same way that some people in ISKCON justify only having male gurus. And I think in both cases, in the Roman Catholic Church and in ISKCON, the Hare Krishna movement, it's a really bad argument. And it's the same bad argument in both religious institutions. So I'm going to go over that. Uh, I saw an interview some time ago, I think over a year ago, whatever it was, uh, on CBS, which is one of the major uh, American uh, television stations. Uh, one of their journalists, important journalists, is a lady named uh, Nora O'Donnell. It's an Irish name, and probably she grew up Catholic. But anyway, she's a very good journalist. She's a very good reporter. She's on the morning news. She's one of the main people. And she was interviewing Cardinal Sean O'Malley. Cardinal Sean O'Malley is the Archbishop of Boston, which is a very, very important Catholic center in the Western Hemisphere. And of course, it was in Boston they had these that big child abuse scandal that, which was depicted in an award-winning movie called Spotlight, where the Boston Herald, the main Boston newspaper, uncovered this massive sex abuse scandal in Boston where the church had basically had the type of social and political power that the church used to have in Ireland. And of course, there's a lot of Irish people in Boston. Anyway, I saw an interview. Uh, Nora O'Connell from CBS interviewed Cardinal Sean O'Malley, the Archbishop of Boston. And also, also, he is um, in charge uh, in the church for the protection of minors. He's actually um, the president of the Vatican's Pontifical Commission for the Protection of Minors. So he is the number one person in the Roman Catholic Church for dealing with abuse of minors, especially sex abuse of minors. He's the guy. And so Nora O'Donnell, this famous uh, journalist, was interviewing him and I thought she did a very good job. She was respectful. Still, she asked the hard questions. And she asked him why women are not allowed to be priests. The answer he gave, which I thought was a terrible argument, and the same terrible argument often given by in ISKCON, <coughs> is as follows. That when Jesus chose his apostles, he only chose men. He only chose men. And if Jesus would have wanted women to be priests, <coughs> he would have chosen some female apostles, but he didn't. Now, let's see if we can count all the really big mistakes in this argument. Number one, when Jesus chose apostles, he never said that uh, I am choosing uh, apostles to be the models for a future priesthood. Because during the time of Jesus, there was no church. There wasn't even the word Christianity didn't exist during the life of Jesus. And Jesus certainly was not choosing priests for a religious institution, which didn't exist. In fact, one of the main opponents of Jesus were the priests, the Jewish priests called the Sadducees. They were in charge of the great temple in Jerusalem. And so not only did Jesus not appoint priests, uh, he was often engaged in battling the priests. So I'm not, I don't mean to say he gave an eternal, eternal injunction that there shall never be priests among my followers, but he was not appointing priests uh, 
he was appointing just leaders for his church. Now, if we take that argument seriously, if we look at the argument logically, in other words, we reduce it down to simple logical terms, the argument is that in appointing apostles, Jesus was establishing a bodily requirement for another position, not apostles, but priests. Again, Jesus was not appointing priests, he was appointing apostles, and he did not say he was establishing a bodily requirement. Not only that, since Israel 2,000 years ago was a very male-dominated society, uh, it was natural that people that sort of had the freedom to come out and publicly lead everything uh, might be men, although there were female leaders of the church uh, of, in the movement of Jesus early on. That's, that's a whole other topic. But if you take this argument seriously, that Jesus was establishing a bodily requirement for any future church leader, including priest, then the conclusion would be that the only people eligible to become Catholic priests or Christian priests are Jewish men born in Israel. Because during the time of Jesus, his movement was not Christianity. The word didn't exist. No one thought it was a separate religion. After Jesus was gone, Paul kind of worked on this, Paul of Tarsus, St. Paul, if you accept him as a saint. <clears throat> but during the life of Jesus, everyone understood, including Roman historians and including the authors of the New Testament, who often show that Jesus is called rabbi, Jesus is presented as a rabbi in the New Testament. So everyone understood back then that uh, the Jesus movement, not Christianity, was simply a, um, a different kind of Judaism. And in the New Testament, all the followers of Jesus were Jews. Jesus basically did not preach to Gentiles, non-Jews. So all the apostles were Jewish men, not Christian. They were not Christian. For example, the Apostle James, the brother of Jesus, was an Orthodox Jew who went to the temple every day and followed all the Jewish laws. So the Apostles were not Christian. The Apostles were Jewish. And they were all born in Israel. So if, as Cardinal Sean O'Malley said, that in appointing Apostles, Jesus was establishing a bodily requirement for all time for priests, a different position, then only a Jewish man born in Israel can be a Catholic priest. That would certainly be a very interesting conclusion and would probably dramatically reconfigure the Roman Catholic Church. Now, if we go to ISKCON, we find the same, that some people in ISKCON give the same bad argument. That when Prabhupada chose gurus, or chose people to become gurus when he left this world, he only chose men. Now, again, the hidden assumption here is that in, in appointing successor gurus, Prabhupada was establishing a bodily requirement to be a guru. Prabhupada was going against the statement that Lord Chaitanya that found the Chaitanya Charitamrita, J Krishna J Krishna Tattva Veta Se Guru Hoy. Whoever knows the science of Krishna is a guru. No, Prabhupada established a bodily requirement which goes against history, since there were female gurus in Vaishnava history, and goes against Shastra. Obviously, Prabhupada wasn't doing that. But let's run with this argument. Let's see what happens if we uh, go down the road with this argument that in appointing gurus, Prabhupada is establishing a bodily requirement for gurus. Then the conclusion is that only a male, white American can be an ISKCON guru. Because if you say, for example, myself, I, on the bodily platform, I am an American, I am Caucasian, uh, and I am male. I'm a male, white American in terms of my body type. So of those three things that I'm male, white American, on what grounds can you take one of them, male, 
and say the other two body designations Prabhupada was not interested in. He was not interested in the fact that I was white or that I was American. He was only interested in the fact that I'm male. Like, why would you say that? And Prabhupada never said it. But still, if you go with this, Prabhupada never said, I am establishing a bodily requirement to be guru in ISKCON. He never said that. But still, it would be a white male American. So if you're a guru in ISKCON and you're not a white male American, you probably should uh, resign. So obviously, that's not what I really think. But I find it fascinating that both the Catholic Church and some people in ISKCON give that same, I would say, fallacious argument. And uh, in the Catholic Church, because they have this requirement only unmarried men, which makes it worse, the reason that's kind of really absurd is because we already know that women and married men, and women, married or unmarried women, can be excellent ministers and priests because, for example, in the Protestant denominations and, 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 and in many forms of Judaism, there are female priests and rabbis and ministers, and many of them do an outstanding job. So if one argues that a woman cannot do the job, that argument is like saying the earth is flat. It's like saying the earth is flat. Just like, you know, airplanes, which some people still believe, by the way, just like airplanes fly around the earth. So we have thousands of examples in the world of women who do a really good job as priests, ministers, rabbis. And so to say a woman cannot do the job is just basically closing your eyes and talking without looking at the real world. So anyway, that's a news item. The Catholic Church is having major problems directly related to its artificial rule that only unmarried men can be priests. And uh, they're, now there have been calls by bishops. An archbishop has called for the Pope to resign. Unfortunately, he's really against the Pope because he thinks the Pope is too liberal, even though the Pope is against women being priests or married men being priests. So even that is too liberal for some leaders in the Catholic Church and they're calling for him to resign the grounds that he knew about child abuse and did not act. So anyway, it's not easy uh, having a religious institution in this day and age. And uh, I've made a few comments based on how I think we could improve this gone and how I think the Roman Catholic Church, which we are not against, uh, how they might improve. So thank you very much. Every day I'm going to try to say a few words on, maybe that was more than a few words, but I'm going to try to say something about what's going on in the world today. So thank you all for watching and uh, hopefully see you tomorrow. Hare Krishna.